the woman whom you put here with me. She gave me the fruit from the tree, so I ate it. This is what happens when men obey their wives and not the other way around. We have uh, in this scene this cascade of, of evil, right? And it's not, it's not what I was joking about earlier, but there's this cascade of evil that happens in the garden um, that's worth kind of looking at because what we celebrate today in the Immaculate Conception is the undoing of much of that evil. It's certainly starting the feet, lighting the fuse of what ultimately is going to be the powder keg that destroys the, uh, the gates of hell. So we have uh, this tree in the garden. God makes all the stuff. He says, eat anything you want. Why has he got to make a tree that you can't eat? Why has he got to do that? You ever wonder? Is, is, is it just to put a thumb in Adam's eye? Hey, here's, everything's cool, everything's okay, except for this one thing, do that and the whole universe goes to pot. <laughs> right? Why? Does anybody know? It's one, it's one word. Choice. choice is a good answer. I'm going to go with freedom, though. It's choice, freedom, that you guys, are, you guys are on the same track. It's about freedom. God created his higher creatures, those that looked like him, in freedom. He made the angels with freedom, freedom of intellect and will, to know and to will, to choose what they, about what they knew. He made humanity, similarly with an intellect and a will, although we're encased in, in flesh, whereas angels are not. That's an advantage to them, except for when it comes to screwing up. If an angel messes up, if he makes a, a, an error of judgment, he's donezo. That's it. There's no forgiveness for an angel. Why? Because in the angel's capacity, they know everything perfectly already. And so if they choose against God... They've chosen with full knowledge and full consent. What did Jesus say was our excuse from the cross? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. The difficulty of our intellect and will having to navigate this flesh and to live in time where a record of change occurs allows for us to gain information to recognize that we've had bad information, to replace that with good information, that in having good information, we might process it badly, or for, uh, for the wrong pursuit of what we perceive to be good, misperceiving something evil for something good, and we go after it, and we do it, and we sin. But because of all that complexity, God says it's okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be patient with you because you'll, you, maybe you'll learn more stuff that you don't already know and it'll change you. Or maybe you'll fix your appetites, which is what we call growing in virtue, so that you desire the good thing for, the, for its own sake and not for some selfish reason, right? Like people look at pornography because they desire um, either a release for uh, uh, an anger or an impotent rage, or they're looking for companionship, or they're looking for intimacy. There's a lot of good things that a person is missing and wants to have when they seek to satisfy those good cravings in something evil. Right? It's, the, it's either an ignorance of how evil that is that allows them to go there, or the strength of the appetite that says, I want this and I don't care what I have to break to get it, right? This is what we kind of find happening in the garden, and it's all happening because of that freedom of choice. If we did not have the ability to choose evil, is there any credit to us doing good? No. No, that's okay. That's, that's fine. I, I would love to actually ask what your train of thought was on that, but this would be an appropriate time to do that. 
Somebody said yes, and I'm, I'm really intrigued to, to hear why. But because, I mean, I, I think there's some good reasons why they, they might have said that. But no, the answer, when you really boil it down, is no. Because if there was no alternative, there's no virtue, there's no merit in us choosing, there wouldn't be choice at all. We would be doing the good thing without choice. Our merit comes in our choice. That while there's something evil out there that we could do, we've nevertheless chosen to do the good thing. I want, you to, I want to step back for a moment then and look at these two creatures that we're talking about. Ain't the angels, right? They don't have a body, but they do have an intellect and a will. Their intellect doesn't process through a brain like ours does, right? And they have a will which doesn't process through the, the passions of the body the way ours do. They do things instantaneously, without error. It's like the difference between one of those spun-up uh, uh, hard drives and like a solid state drive, right? Angels are solid state drives, we're the spinners, right? We, we still have to write on a disc and it takes a long time, right? The combat between good and evil is not between God and the devil. It's supposed to be between humanity and the devil. There's no contest with God. God is who is. But the devil and his fallen angels and all the good angels and us, we're mere creatures. We are far closer in, e in equality to the angels than the angels are to God. And let me tell you something. We got nothing on the angels. So this contest between good and evil. The contest for salvation, for the restoration, not just of humanity, because you have to understand something. When Adam fell, the whole universe suffered for it. St. Paul tells us that all of creation is groaning in agony, groaning in pain, waiting for the redemption of humanity. Guys, we have a Middle Earth, Lord of the Rings scenario going on. It's that dramatic. And so many times we think of ourselves, humanity, as being trapped in this tug of war between the devil and between God. There's no contest there. The fight's between us and the devil for the glory of God and the salvation of our souls. And never any clearer has that been seen than in these two women whom we speak of today. Eve who is called so because she became the mother of all the living, and Mary, who became the mother of God. The devil fights both of these women. And he gets over on Eve. He gets over on Eve because of Adam, because of Adam's failure. He was permitted to gain entrance to the human scene by confusing Eve and getting Eve to do something that was wrong. And then Adam's failure to protect her so that that, wasn't, that didn't happen in the first place, but to invert the proper order of things and obey his wife caused this, this cascade of, of evil that has just emanated or has, has um, rippled out into the universe. Right? Did God tell you that you couldn't eat from any plant in the garden? Well, no, Eve says. No, no, we can eat of all the trees in the garden, just not that one. But why? Why is he trying to keep that from you? What's he hiding from you? You shouldn't trust somebody who hides things from you. Don't you see how good it is for food? Don't you see how delightful it is to the eye? How good it is for gaining knowledge? Why would he keep that from you? He's tricking you, Eve. Huh. Now this is where Adam should have stabbed him in the eye with a stick. And he didn't do it. And Eve... For whatever reason, subject to this confusion, this manipulation, took the fruit and ate it. This is 
says nothing about any sort of intrinsic quality of, of, of intelligence between men and women, not, not at all. The, the devil chose Eve to assault, and he, and he won. And, and so Eve was the first to fall, but Adam was the responsible one to fall. When Adam fell, because Adam was not tricked, because Adam was stronger, because Adam was meant to be, or it was the ordinate actor in this scene of the, of, the, of the Garden of Eden, when he, of his own volition, without confusion, said, very well, I'll do what the Lord God said not to do, that's when the universe went to chaos. When God decided to restore everything that Adam broke, to bring humanity back to himself, to reconcile us to his friendship. It's important for us to know that we're born enemies of God. Doesn't matter how cute and cuddly you are. You're an enemy of God. Uh, forfeiting and, and abdicating heaven. It's only through baptism that we're reconciled to, to friendship again. So in God's mysterious plan of reconciling us back to himself after that cataclysmic disaster of Adam and Eve. It's fitting that he allows the two great players of this drama to have their own share and participation in the restoration, Eve and the devil. So when God decided he was going to take on flesh and become man, and his name became Jesus, we know in hindsight, looking back at the unity of these two covenants, that Jesus is the new Adam. And he is not going to do what the first Adam failed to do. But how inappropriate would it be for him to exclude the other half of his beautiful creation, the Eve, the one in whom he found such delight. The one who represented all of humanity, the mother of all the living. And so he draws to himself in a way that is uh, re reflective of his own glory. He draws to himself one who, though fully human and only human, is nevertheless full of grace and united to him in a unique way as Eve was united to Adam. Not spousally, but familially. And in the kingdom into which Jesus is born, the kingdom of David, whose throne he will take, Eve becomes queen. Or excuse me, not Eve does not become queen, the mother becomes queen. So the new Eve is not the spouse. Jesus is celibate, he doesn't have a spouse. But he does have a new Eve. He does have a queen to his king. And it is his mother, Mary. And so here we have the introduction of the, the first of the two great players in this drama of disaster that Jesus is coming to fix. Eve, the new Eve, Mary. And so the angel comes to Mary and says, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. You are full of grace. Gratia plena. There is no more room for grace. You are full of it, Mary. Grace, that is. What that is, is an indication of her perfection. Because it's by grace that we are saved. Mary already possesses a fullness of her grace, which if you listen to the opening prayer in the Mass, it's because of a foreshadowing or a foreknowledge of the work that Adam would do. Jesus says, I will not fail. And so the grace of the cross is credited to Mary, that she might be conceived herself in such a way as to become a fitting helpmate for the new Adam. As the new Adam is perfect, so also the new Eve is perfect. Not divine, perfect. What's wrong with being perfect and human? Everybody thinks that if you're perfect, you got to be God. No. Mary can be perfect and still be a human being. Right? So now, when the contest happens time and again throughout the New Testament, where the devil comes to inflict harm, it's oftentimes Mary who comes to the aid or the antidote to the venom of the, of the, the devil. Look at the most dramatic 
point, the most, some of the most dramatic moments in this. Jesus is carrying his cross. Did you guys see the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion? I, I hope everybody has seen it. It's difficult to watch, but it's, it's very good and very worthwhile. When Jesus is carrying his cross, you see the combat taking place. Not between Jesus and the devil, but between Jesus and Mary. Now, this is apocryphal. Well, not necessarily apocryphal. It's, this is a vision of, of, a, of, a, of a visionary, of a, a mystic. So it's not canonical, but it is, it is worth noting. Jesus is walking down the road carrying the cross, beat to hell. And Mary is walking on one side of this, of this lane, passing through the crowd, keeping sight on her son. And her eyes are drawn away from her son for a moment to this horrific androgynous binary uh, demonic thing, right? Who's carrying an equally demonic little nasty split tongue baby. The devil is mocking the fruit of Mary's womb, this beat up, lacerated, bruised, Jesus, who's carrying a cross. He's mocking her. I beat him. And she just looks back to her son. And he falls. And he goes, she goes to him. And she encourages him. And he says, see, mother, I make all things new. In a word, Mary, who alone has authority over God insofar as she is the mother of the Son of God, could have said, Son, that's enough. I can't bear to watch you anymore. Be done with this. Heal yourself and go on your way. Her failure in that moment would have caused us our condemnation for eternity. If her maternal heart had given in to vice, if she had given in to the discouragement being heaped upon her by the mockery of the devil, we would have been absolutely and utterly abandoned because Jesus would have snapped to, tossed off the cross, healed himself, probably spewed fire on all the Pharisees and walked out of the city and went and lived in a cave with his mom for the rest of the days and saved only her probably. But it was, the, it was the cooperation between the new Eve and the new Adam that allowed us to enter, it allows us to hope to enter into paradise. Because what once was perfect and made ruined had divinity and the perfection of humanity united in that cosmic unity enter into that destruction and reorder it, heal it, make it new. This is how delighted God is in letting his creatures have a participation in his actions. We already understand, or at least I hope we understand, that procreation, the word itself, means creating with God. The activity of creating is unique to God alone. Everything that we do is simply making. It's taking stuff he's already made and making it into something different. That's making. That's not creating. Nobody creates anything. Even art. We say people create art. Although that's not art. Let's see. Art. Right? That's not really creation. It's, a, it's us envisioning a reflection of, some, of, of the substance of goodness or of beauty that God is, is, is manifesting to us, that we, that we develop into art. Procreation, then, is that God, from the very beginning of time, has planned to share his power to create with us for one specific reason. To bring more of, our, of his creation into the world. So that we can share in that. When a child is conceived, a new universe is born. 
A new universe comes into existence between a, a husband, or between, well, I should say, a husband and a wife and God's cooperation, participation with one another. Something that, that is more valuable than the entire planet and, and perhaps more valuable than the rest of the created order, with the exception of every other human being, a whole new universe exists. Something that never existed before and never will exist again because it's unique and will never fall out of existence, even if it's killed. Even if it's killed in its own mother's womb. He shares that with us. The ability to do that. How incredible. But it's not simply in making humans or creating humans that are born his enemies in which he takes pleasure in our participation. He wants us to do something more with him and he wants us to share in his work of redemption of that very humanity that we also are able to create. He makes us co-redeemers with him, participators in his great act. Paul tells us that in, he, he makes up, in his own sufferings, he makes up for what is lacking in the cross of Christ. What does that mean? Does that mean that the cross of Christ was lacking? No, what it means is that God is pleased to allow Paul to contribute to the salvation that is won by the cross of Jesus. And he invites each one of us to do the same. And we are able to do that because he first invited Mary to do this. In the great drama of redemption that mirrors, that's the inverse of the great fall. We have Adam and Eve. We have Jesus and Mary. Mary going toe-to-toe once again with the devil as she went toe-to-toe with him back in the garden and winning. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. You will conceive and bear a son, and his name will be Jesus. Mary says, how can this be? That question could have very easily been formatted as it was with Zechariah, with incredulity. What are you talking about? You can't possibly know what you're talking about. My wife can't bear a son. She's old. Zechariah was struck uh, dumb for his incredulity in that moment. But Mary, in her fullness of grace, in her participation with Jesus, doesn't mean that she wasn't tempted to fear, doesn't mean she was tempted to discouragement, doesn't mean she wasn't tempted to doubt. But nevertheless, she said, fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum, let it be done to me according to your word. Victory number one. The wedding feast of Cana, do whatever whatever he tells you. Victory number two. Throughout the scriptures you see this until in the very end, Mary standing at the cross, the, at the foot of the cross, weeping, her, her heart too pierced by a lance, gives encouragement to her son. Die, my son, die. Do what you came to do. I am with you till the end. The words that Jesus says to us undoubtedly were spoken to him by his mother. It's her immaculate conception, her being born perfect, that she might be the perfect vessel for the new Adam, that she might be named the new Eve. And it is in their unity that we ourselves have a unity with Christ that allows us also to be new Eve, to be participators with the new Adam, to be co-redeemers with God himself, and to have some merit in our own redemption. Because we said like Mary, be it done unto me according to your will. Let me help you. I will be with you always. I will never leave your side. I will follow you wherever you go. And that, Jesus says, taking up our cross and following him is what, is what merits our friendship with him and allows us to go to heaven. Don't let the immaculate conception of Mary scare you. It is, in fact, the avenue of our salvation, the beginning of the great work of God to unite us as his friends and an invitation for us to be co-sharers in his victory.